The following year, Bell was back, this time with his new maxi, Condor. And again, he was in the thick of the action. This was the news report. The race loaded into controversy over this incident. Condor crashes into a submerged rock while trying to pass inshore of Nirvana, just 10 kilometres from the finish line. Nirvana miraculously escapes, her helmsman frantically turning the wheel, trying to avoid the rock. But then Condor's boom hits Nirvana's radio aerial at the stern and breaks it off. Amid shouts from both crews, protest flags go up. Nirvana went on unscathed, while Condor's crew tried desperately to free the yacht. They succeeded, but could not make up the lost ground. Nirvana took line honours by just 2 minutes 16 seconds over the rapidly closing Condor. Nirvana's owner, Marvin Green, and Condor's Bob Bell greeted each other coolly at the dock. Bell was sure what happened. After that, they deliberately ran as a ground. Green wasn't keen to comment. I don't think I should talk about it, you know, because it is a protest. But Condor's helmsman, Ted Turner, was also certain what happened. Well, we were ahead of them. Uh, we had just uh, passed them. They passed us in the Darwin, and then we, we were in the act of uh, passing them when they drove us into the rock. The end result? Nirvana disqualified. There have been some other penalties of note in the history of the race. In 1953, Jock Muir's Wild Wave was stripped of line and handicap honours following a collision at the start. More recently, in 1985, Peter Kurt's yacht, Drake's Prayer, was penalised out of first place because of a trivial start line incident. Then, in 1990, just before sponsorship on sales was completely kosher, English yacht Rothmans was stripped of the line honours trophy because it was spotted flying this spinnaker off the Tasmanian coast. Now, back to the good times. And being a classic offshore test, it has attracted some of the world's best boats. Since Rani took six days, 14 hours and 22 minutes to complete the 630 nautical miles back in 1945, the time for the distance has been lowered at somewhat regular intervals. In 1973, the yacht they called the Flying Footpath, the concrete-hulled Helsel, lowered the record to three days, one hour. In 1975, American Jim Kilroy's Maxi Kealoa III arrived on the scene and left an indelible mark on the race. After charging all the way to Hobart before strong following winds, she demolished the record, crossing the line in Hobart just two days, 14 hours, 36 minutes after leaving Sydney. That alone was a remarkable achievement. But the fact that this record has stood the test of time and was still intact as we went into the 50th anniversary race 19 years later shows just how great a performance it was. And as if to cap off that effort, Kealoa 3 came back to Sydney in 1977 and won the race on handicap. She staged an amazing duel with another American maxi, Windward Passage, over the entire course. The pair made an impressive sight as they sailed south with literally everything possible set. But a subtly buster put paid to any hopes they held of a record time. Over the 10 years from 1975 to 85, the Hobart fleet, especially each alternate Southern Cross Cup year, saw a dramatic increase in size, culminating in 179 yachts lining up in 1985. It was a chaotic start from one line which was limited in length by the narrowness of the harbour. It was then believed that the only safe alternative in future years would be to start the race outside the harbour until the unique concept of using two starting lines surfaced. The lines were set 400 metres apart. The big boats started from the front, the smaller yachts from the rear. They then went around separate marks at the heads before turning south, that way ensuring they sailed the same distance to Hobart. The two-line system was first used in 1986 and has been used with success ever since. The development of the skiff-like racing yachts in the late 70s, which followed Piccolo's historic win in 1976, brought great controversy. While designers decided that the lighter the yacht, the faster it was, race organisers questioned the structural integrity and stability of hulls. Keels became incredibly small as crew weight was used as ballast. Seeing a disaster in the making, the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia introduced stringent new laws governing the structure of yachts wanting to race to Hobart. 
there was international furor, but time has shown the club's attitudes to be correct. In fact, its attitudes towards safety in the sport see it recognised today as a world authority. This is due in part to the Hobart race, unlike other classics, being contested annually. That allows for a yearly review of procedures, making the race a testbed for designers, sailmakers and builders. Race reporting has progressed with the development of computers and satellite communications. Back in the 40s, there was no guide as to a handicap winner until the yachts had reached Hobart. Later, the development of manual calculators allowed for some predictions to be made from position reports. Today, satellites and computers combine to generate these progress reports in minutes. The next step will see each competing yacht carry a satellite transmitter which reveals its position, course and speed at any given moment. Rough races have always been remembered and one of the roughest came in 1984. A savage southerly buster ambushed the fleet, delivering some of the worst conditions ever experienced. Only 46 of the 152 starters reached Hobart. During one horrible night at sea, veteran Wal Russell was lost overboard from Yahoo 2. Sadly, the race's first fatality. A stunned crewman told of futile bids to rescue 70-year-old Russell. We were able to bring the boat in alongside where he was, and, uh, but he was uh, unconscious and floating face down. Um, we, um, we, we got within about a metre of him and then we drifted away. And uh, with him being unconscious, we just couldn't get a rope around him or anything. The Maxi named New Zealand took line on us that year and after saying that he was surprised more lives weren't lost in such treacherous conditions, Skipper Peter Blake went on to explain what it was like sailing a Maxi to windward in that weather. So if you can imagine sort of driving a big yacht in, in a lot of wind and climbing up seas that are maybe 25 or 30 feet high, with the odd one coming through at 35 or 40 feet and the top few feet is breaking like surf on a beach and you're not quite sure what's on the other side so you're going up on a real angle and sometimes in the middle of the night which is even worse you can't see anything at all there's no horizon no nothing and suddenly the bow just drops and so you're dropping 25 30 feet so it's like jumping off a three-story building in a truck and then coming up all standing on the concrete below crash bang the boat just shudders and the crew down below is thrown out of their bunks the 49th Hobart race in 1993 was, as predicted by meteorologist Roger Badham, the toughest of all. It could be the worst Sydney Hobart on record. Uh, not so much the, the strongest of the winds, I mean they've had 80 knots I think and going right back in the dim distant past, but if you look at the longevity of this southerly, in fact it could be southerly within the first 12 hours of the start and it could be southerly right through to the, when they enter into the Derwent at Hobart. How right he was. Southerly winds of up to 70 knots and gargantuan breaking seas hammered the fleet. Yachts sank. Others were rolled over and broken up. Coastal ports looked like aquatic junkyards as 67 of the 105 starters sought safe haven. Only 38 yachts reached Hobart and Andrew Strachan's new blue hulled sloop 97, measuring just 13.3 metres, became the smallest yacht in 40 years to take line on us. That race provided a miracle when the skipper of Mem, John Quinn, was plucked from a storm ravaged ocean 45 nautical miles offshore after being overboard for five hours. Quinn was spotted by a crew member of the ship Ampol Sorrel, which was searching in pitch darkness for him. He was then picked up by the team aboard the dismasted and damaged race yacht Atara. Back on shore, Quinn told what happened. Big wave kiss and uh, just broke over the boat, you know, put the boat on the side. And then uh, I went over with the boat and uh, broke the harness. I got a bit desperate towards the end. But, uh, because I, I was beginning to lose uh, body temperature, you know. A Tara crewman, Fraser Johnston, detailed the rescue. Well, first we lost one of our guys overboard in the first pass. So we had two in the water. We got him back on. And, uh, uh, and then we went back and got this guy. He was pretty well stuffed, actually. He was finished. Um, he had enough now to keep yelling, but he was no help to us pulling him on board. Better take him around the stern and pull him in. 
But he grabbed hold of the rope like a drowning man will. He wouldn't let the rope go. And what did this marathon swimmer decide to do once back on shore? We're, we're just going up to the pub and... Uh... Over the 50 years, near 5,000 yachts and 35,000 sailors have been part of the Sydney Hobart Classic. Some race to win, others to simply be part of the crowd. Some are fortunate enough to win first up. For others, like the perennial Sid Fisher, it took time. It was not until his 25th race in 1992 that he saw the famous name of his yacht Ragamuffin go on to the winner's trophy. Why do they do it? And why do they keep coming back for more? The race, the challenge of air and ocean when aboard a small yacht is infectious. Punishing as it is pleasant, it is on the must-do agenda for just about everyone with salt in their veins. Thank you. 